Hi, I'm Dick Norris, and this video addresses how we make sense of large amounts of structural or geophysical data. So here, for instance, are strike and dip measurements of joint planes in Joshua Tree National Park. Are there really regular patterns in these data? It's hard to tell. Now, an important tool for interpreting kind of a mess of data like this is called a stereonet, a graphical two-dimensional representation of three-dimensional data. The stereo net represents planes, like the surfaces, for example, of joints, or sedimentary bedding, uh, or perhaps lines like metamorphic lineations, in a two-dimensional diagram, so we can see regular patterns if they exist in the data. You can think of the stereo net as a graphical representation of a bowl. So here we have a bowl, for instance, and this one we've marked off the angles of azimuth around the periphery from the north uh, position, here's the south position down here. Um, and we can think of this um, piece of, of cardboard here as a plane that is dipping of so, at some angle. And here is the strike line of that, um, of that dipping bed that is defined by where these lines intersect the edge of the bowl. And then you can see that the plane is dipping into the bowl maybe around 45 degrees. And as a consequence, it defines a curving line uh, in the bottom of the bowl. And that curvature is a lot less when the uh, plane is dipping on essentially vertically, uh, and it's a lot more when the plane is dipping very shallowly uh, into the bowl. Now we can represent that whole thing as a two-dimensional uh, plot like this. This is called a Schmidt net, uh, and there's also something called a Wolf net, which is, uh, which is similar to this. Um, in this case, again, we've marked the zero point at the top, that's the north area, and then the angles of azimuth around the periphery. And you can think of this as looking into the interior of a curved bowl, like this one, okay? Uh, where this would be the bottom of the bowl, right there in the middle of the diagram. Now, I plotted on this three different planes, okay, like yay. Uh, and one of those planes is vertical, it's just dipping uh, straight into the bottom of the bowl, and so it makes a, a straight line across the middle of the stereo net. And then the others are more uh, gently curving, uh, or more strongly curving, actually, uh, representing increasingly shallow dips uh, towards the southeast in this particular case, because that's north, like that. And so that's pretty useful information. We can tell just simply by the curvature of the lines uh, what the dip angle uh, must be. Uh, and also, of course, we record the strike. Okay, so here's a representation now of the Joshua Tree joint orientations on a stereo net. And know that the lines here are nearly straight across the stereo net, suggesting that the joints are nearly vertical. They have essentially vertical dips. But the strikes are in at least two major orientations, and one set is at 90 degree angles to the other. There are programs that will do the plotting for you, such as something called StereoNet, haha, <laughs> okay, it's freeware, but we can also do this manually with a paper StereoNet. Here I have a StereoNet that I have laid a piece of plastic over, I use a pin in the middle to hold the two together, or a protractor like this one to anchor the plastic sheet to the StereoNet. And the horizontal line across the middle, the east-west line, is called the primitive line, by the way, um, and the curved lines, on the other hand, coming from north to south, are lines of meridians, or great circles. Now to plot strike and dip of bedding, where strike is 45 degrees to the northeast and dip is 45 degrees to the southeast, we make a tick mark at the 45 degree angle where it intersects the edge of the stereo net, okay, the upper right side of the stereo net. We can then rotate the stereo net around the center axis so that the tick mark sits at the north or a zero degree position. The bedding plane will be represented by a curved line following one of those great circles. And to figure out which one it is, we need to know which way the plane is dipping. If the plane dips towards the east, then you count in 45 degrees uh, from the east towards the center uh, of the stereo net along the primitive line. And on the other hand, if the plane dips to the west, then you count in 45 degrees from the western end of the primitive line. Um, in both cases, of course, we count inward from the edge of the stereo net towards the center because the edge of the stereo net represents a zero degree dip and the middle of the stereo net represents a 90 degree dip. So our 45 degree dips must be somewhere in between. 
Now, by the way, if you use the right hand rule, okay, to record your strike and dip data, where your, your thumb represents the strike direction and your, your rest of your hand uh, represents the angle of dip, if you lay your hand on a dipping bed, um, you can always see very quickly which direction the plane dips, even if the tabular data uh, come out of a field notebook or something like that. You don't actually have a visual representation of the orientation of strike and dip. Now, in our case, we count in 45 degrees from the east because we have a southeast dip, where the major tick marks are in 10 degree increments and the minor ones represent 2 degrees. Now, the last step is to draw along the great circle that connects the north and south ends of the stereo net through that 45 degree tick mark. When we now rotate the stereo net back to its north position, the curved line is an accurate representation of the dip of bedding. In this case, a bed with approximately northeast uh, strike uh, and southeast dip. Now, one final thing, a stereo net can be pretty cluttered with curved lines if you have lots of data. So another way to represent the same information is to do what's called plotting the pole to a plane of bedding. This pole is 90 degrees to the surface of the bed. So if we come back to our bowl here, for example, uh, and we pick up our plane, you can see that a very shallowly dipping uh, plane like that, if we look at the 90 degree, um, uh, the pole is 90 degrees to that, like this, uh, and that's going to plot near the middle of the stereo net uh, somewhere, like that. And on the other hand, if the, uh, if the planes are very steeply dipping, okay, like that, uh, then the pole to those planes will plot someplace along the edge uh, of the stereo net. So again, these poles to the plane can completely represent the information uh, recorded by the, the angle and the orientation of that, uh, of that great circle that we were using before. So to return to our last stereo net, the pole to our bed with a strike of 45 and a dip of 45 degrees can be determined by going back to the position of the stereo net where we first plotted the dip. But in this case, we count 90 degrees from that great circle towards the middle of the bed, actually past typically the middle of the bed, um, until we get to 90 degrees. That point is the pole to the plane of our bed. And when we again rotate the stereo net back to the zero degree position with north at the top, that dot represents the pole to the plane represented by that great circle. Um, so to finish everything up, if we go back to our Joshua tree data and replace the great circles as on the plot with the poles to those planes, you can see it makes a much neater uh, and actually probably more visually appealing kind of diagram. You can see that there's a series of points that are in the middle okay, of the bowl, in the middle of the stereo net, and those must represent planes that are nearly horizontal, like this, okay, uh, and therefore the poles are plotting near the middle of the stereo net. And then there's a series of data points that are around the periphery uh, of the stereo net, and those must represent very steeply dipping beds where the poles are plotting near the edges of the stereo net. And so, in fact, there are three major populations. There are two joint sets that are nearly vertical and at right angles to each other. Uh, those are represented by the poles around the edge of the stereo net. And then there are a series of, of uh, poles in the middle of the stereo net that represent nearly horizontal joint sets. Um, so that's how we plot stereo net uh, data sets uh, and the different ways in which you can treat it. So thanks for watching.